Hey gang, this episode of WTF is sponsored by Stamps.com. Go to Stamps.com and type in WTF when you click the radio microphone to start a no-risk trial and get a $110 bonus offer. That's Stamps.com. Enter WTF. Do it up. All right, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fucking ears? What the fucking rock and rollers? Yes, this is Mark Marin. This is WTF. This is a big day on the show. Uh, it's a very exciting day on the show. And I will tell you why in just a minute. It has to do with our guest, and it has to do with his importance in my life. Well, obviously, that's secondary. But uh, before I do anything, if you're not watching Inside Amy Schumer on Comedy Central, you should be, my friends. You've heard her on my show. She's hilarious. And the show is a great vehicle for her. That's what we call it in show business, a vehicle. It's a good Amy Schumer vehicle. Tuesday nights on Comedy Central. There's a new episode this week, but you can check out a lot of clips and more on ComedyCentral.com. So go do that. L.A. people and Pasadena people. L.A. area. I'll be at the Ice House in Pasadena doing some time on June 2nd, trying to integrate some new stuff. I don't know if you see me there in the last six months. This is the beginning, the beginning of the new work, but I can't say it's all going to be new work. But if you want to see me and hang out, I'll be there. All right? It'll be nice. It'll be fun. Dave Anthony's opening for me. Okay. That's that. John Fogarty, my friends. John Fogarty is on the show today. I went to his home and sat with him for a long time and talked about stuff. And I had to think a lot about John Fogarty when I was driving to his home. But I think about John Fogarty a lot. I think about Creedence Clearwater Revival a lot. I'm amazed at how fucking great their music is and was and forever will be because it's some timeless shit, man. I mean, how often do you really listen to music that is timeless? I mean, there's only a few. There's only a few. There's some country stuff that, you know, Neil Young has a certain element of timelessness. That you can't hinge it to any time. I mean, I've got all this great stereo equipment here at my house. And if somebody comes over and they want to hear something, I put on Creedence's first record. I've got like the first, I got, I think I have all their albums on Fantasy Records. And I have, I've had them a long time. I somehow inherited them. I think I got them from my aunt and uncle's collection when I was like maybe 13. But more importantly, Creedence Clearwater Revival was pounded into my head at a very early age as some of the first rock and roll music I ever really took in that ever really moved me, man. I mean, there's some shit that just sticks in your craw in a good way and then digs like a mole right into your heart, man. Man, I'm going to be manning it up. Man up to the man. But here's the deal. I mean, when I was like, I got to be eight years old. I don't have a lot of music recollections. I remember listening to some Bobby Sherman on a close and play or something with them briefcases, briefcase uh, turntables, but not really having a selection. I remember doing that in Alaska. So I had a selection. I had some tapes that apparently my parents weren't using. They were junk in this uh, Iowa. That was mine now and had detachable speakers, which was pretty cool for 1970, whatever the hell it was. When was this record put out? It was put. Yeah. So it's probably 71. Because the record was put out in 70. But I had a cassette down there. I had, I had a few cassettes. I had uh, Johnny Cash, Live at San Quentin. Great thing to put in a, you know, an eight-year-old's head. I had uh, Bobby Gentry. I had Jerry Vale's Greatest Hits. God Didn't Make Little Green Apples was on there. And on the Bobby Gentry album, Ode to Billy Joe was on there. That was kind of... I didn't quite understand that song, I found, after uh, later I saw the movie. And I had Cosmos Factory by Creedence Clearwater Revival. And one of the first guitar licks I ever remember plowing its way into my brain and sticking was the opening riff to Up Around the Bend. It just cuts in, man. It just cuts into your head and stays there. There was a purity to his guitar sound and a purity and earnestness to his singing. And I'm driving out to his house. I'll tell you how into, uh, into Fogarty I was and am, into Credence. Like when he, when he came out with Centerfield after we hadn't really heard from him in a long time in a big way, 
I was excited that he got a hit and he sounded so fucking great. I was excited. All those great Creedence songs, you know, he didn't have ownership of them because he got screwed on a deal when he was a kid by his first manager. And from what I understand, legal problems went on for years and years. But I didn't really want to get into that with him. I just didn't want to. I want to talk about music. I got into it a little bit, but I wanted to talk about music. I didn't, you know, I know when you talk to somebody about a lawsuit that you might get into a conversation, not unlike talking to somebody about a divorce. If the anger is still there, the intensity changes, and you go down a rabbit hole of injustice. So I didn't want to do that. He's got this new album out, uh, wrote a song for everyone, and it's a collaboration album. He does Fortunate Son with the Foo Fighters, which is outstanding. There's a couple of new tunes on here, which are great. But he does uh, Long As I Can See the Light with Mor- My Morning Jacket. Spectacular. He does um, Who'll Stop the Rain with Bob Seger. Great. Hot Rod Heart with Brad Paisley. That guy can play. Have you ever seen The Rain with Alan Jackson? This is the thing about it. There's a country to it. There's a, there's a rock to it. But it, none of the songs are dated. And this album, this new album is fucking spectacular. All right, so I was nervous, but I think I did okay. I love this guy, and there's something about the the rawness of how he sings and the music of how it holds up that you just, you know, you want him to be a great guy, and he was a great guy. He's kind of a firecracker, you know what I mean? He's kind of a, I could feel that if you pushed it, you know, you get a little bit of, he'd go at you, you know what I mean? He's he's a live wire. So let's talk to, uh, let's talk to um, John in a minute. And by the way, I'm going to be, uh, he asked me to introduce him at the El Rey tomorrow night. And I'm nervous about that. But about just bringing the guy up on stage. I'm like, I better write something down. I better get something together. John Fogarty, I'm going to bring John Fogarty. One of, the, one of the greatest rock and roll artists that ever lived. Seriously. Wow. What I got to tell you a couple of things I, uh, before we get into John right now. Uh, Mike Lawrence, my buddy who opens for me, very funny guy. Uh, his album comes out on May 28th on iTunes and Amazon. Sadamantium is the name of the album. Um, and also the music on today's show uh, is by the Zigzags. And also it's stamps.com time. And it's time to liberate yourself from the postage meter. Postage meter companies used to have the monopoly on printing postage no longer. They could charge a huge markup to print postage from your own office. No longer. With Stamps.com, get all the benefits of a postage meter without feeling ripped off. All you need is your computer, printer, and Stamps.com to get official U.S. postage for any letter or package, any class of mail, my friends. No more postage meter. No more post office. Just you and your desk and a hat or, or an outfit if you choose. Naked if you want. Be like me. Do it in your garage. Naked sometimes. Use my promo code WTF for this special offer. Start a no-risk trial and get a $110 bonus offer. That includes the digital scale and up to $55 of free postage. Don't wait. Go to Stamps.com. Before you do anything else, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in WTF. That's Stamps.com. Type in WTF. John Fogarty, man. John fucking Fogarty, you guys. Let's talk to the man now at his home. I got to tell you, uh, it, it is a, an amazing honor for me to be here with you. Well, thank you. It's an honor for me, too. I, uh, I actually uh, had a moment at the Burbank Airport. I flew on a Southwest flight with you. and it was Where were we going? I don't remember where we were coming back from, but I remember we were coming back from somewhere, and it was one of those situations where I'm sitting there, and I'm like, well, that's John Fogarty. I, maybe I should say something. And then I, then I have to think, well, what am I going to say to that guy? And I think I said, I love your work. And you said, well, thank you. <laughs> that was oh, our, did you? Oh, yeah, okay. That was our big moment. Yeah, yeah. If, if you probably overthought the <laughs> yeah. whole thing. I, I definitely overthink everything. a lot of people do say, you know, people are pretty cool. They don't bug you. Yeah. You know, they don't uh-huh. like, uh, well, my cousin in uh, Peoria, 
you know, loved your music. Can I get your uh, autograph? First, let me go find a pen. Uh, do you have a pen? Uh, How know, do you handle that? You kind of go, um, I'm double barked. <laughs> i got to go. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, I, uh, I it's interesting because uh, I just bought a bunch of stereo equipment, you know, for vinyl. I'm going back to vinyl, and uh, I got a tube amp, you know, to play the vinyl through. Yeah. And somehow I, I had about, I had the first five Credence albums since I was a kid. Wow. And they're all in pretty good shape. And the reason I'm telling you this is when I have people over and I want to show off my record player in my new system, I put on the first Credence album. Oh, okay. And I just blast that up, and to me, somehow or another, that thing sounds perfect. When you were, do you have a good recollection of how you produce that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Why does it sound so clean and so good? Did you just? It was it just pure? Uh, well, I, I think the real answer is it's pretty simple, straight, forward arrangements. You uh-huh. know, I mean, in other words, there's. Uh, <laughs> What I discovered was that, that um, you know, long before uh, the records I made with Credence, the the stuff that sounds great in your car on the radio. Yeah, I mean that's that's really the litmus test. That's if if you can do something that sounds great in your car on the radio, you are <laughs> in the uh, uh, high echelon of uh, the holy grail of you know? producing. Yeah. And, and so time, what I what I did learn, yeah. basically, in a car with a speaker that's about that big, but then it resonates all throughout your what pa- passenger compartment, yep. I guess. Um, you want that voice, you yeah. know, the the thing that's if, if it's a song with singing. Yeah. You want the voice. You yeah. want to be able to hear the voice. And the next thing you want to be able to hear, at least to me, is the drum, right? Backbeat, right? right. Yeah. And then the next thing, if there's a guitar solo, which would be true heaven for yeah, me yeah uh you want to be able to hear that so that was basically and everything else is sort of supportive and so uh i that was kind of how i rolled that I, I wanted that to to be the stuff that i guess that was coming through in your car and you can hear everything and it turns out yeah and it's still it's still true now i, I think it'll be true for all of time um because those things are all roughly in the same uh, frequency register, right? Kind of what we used to call mid-range. Yeah. Um, you you can have a heck of a rock and roll record if you if those three things are very apparent and also good. Right. You know, if you got nineteen rhythm guitars and all these little things going on <laughs> back there and chirps and and yeah. the violin section and yeah. yada yada. You know, it's it's just like getting too esoteric. So I mean, and it's still true. The best stuff is where the the voice and the drum. And the guitar are, are right up front. where you can tell. Yeah, you can hear it. And basically, so you, you kind of intersperse them. Yeah. You don't have them all happen at the same time. You, you It's either the vocal and the drum or the guitar and the drum, but not all of them hitting at the same time because they're all in the same frequency well that, well, that explains it perfectly because when I listen to it, I can hear everything. You know, they're, they're, and it's everything is its own thing, and it just kind of hangs together. And perfectly. they really stand out. You know, think oh, of yeah, Suzy Q. I mean, the guy, oh Suzy Q, and then they get that, da 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 da, right? They're not at the same time, right? And that Chuck Berry kind of taught us all that thing a long time ago. He did, right? Yeah. Were those the ones that moved you the most? Go Johnny, go go, na 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 na, go. You know, just hear that guitar. That's it, and just say he had a keyboard though. He had the he had that's the extra stuff, but that drum was amazing. Yeah. What was a, what were those the guys that moved you early on to to sort of start making records? I mean, what was the stuff? Because when you talk about that car speaker, you're talking about back in the day when there was one speaker, and that was pretty yeah, much it. Yeah, right. and it was right on the dashboard, and it had to get all Stereo the stereo was some sort of communist invention. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know what that. I did not know what stereo was when I made the record Suzy Q. Was it in I mono? had not heard stereo. I thought I was inventing stereo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if you listen to Suzy Q now, it's very apparent. It's not in stereo. Right. There's stuff on the left. Right. There's stuff on the right. There's nothing in the middle. Does you some know, stuff I, move? Am I remembering yeah, it does, right? Yeah, it goes from this yeah, one yeah, to yeah, that yeah, one. Right. But it's, there's nothing staying in the middle because it, it really wasn't uh, mixed from it, – it wasn't mixed into a place with a middle. Right. It was basically – from the four tracks, and o- there was only four tracks, right. that, that thing, you know, we yeah, yeah. had a lot of overdubbing and ping-ponging, yeah, where yeah. you add, 
you play you're playing back something and adding to it, and that all goes on to a track together the way right, right. the way we had to do it then. But what I'm getting at, there's only left and right information, and after I after living through that, I thought to myself. Man, it'd be really cool if you could have something in the middle. There ought to be a knob that like <laughs> combines the left and the right, and then you could like dial that like at nine o'clock, ten o'clock. You know, yeah, sure. It could, right, it could go across. Your, what do you call it? field of vision? Except this is field of hearing. Hearing, yeah. Right. Uh, I, I thought I was creating this. I even had a little. I wired a little <laughs> box with some jacks, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. in it, and then uh, <laughs> the next <laughs> studio I went to that was kind of an upgrade. Yeah. I. Oh, they've already got that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess I didn't invent that thing. No. Yeah. So I can't take credit for it. Yeah. So when uh, when when you started playing, what was the guitar you used on that first one? That's the Rickenbacker, little 325. Yeah. That's on Suzy Q. Yeah, they, a lot of people call that the John Lennon model. I'd always hope someday they might call it the John Fogarty model. There's still time. Uh, yeah, still I don't time. know. I gave mine away at the Fulmore East. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. You just gave uh, it to a dude? I uh, yeah, a kid that was a 12-year-old kid that uh, was hanging out all the time. I don't know why he got to do that, but at the end of the last show we were going to do, you know, that run, I called him out on stage and said, I'm going to play one more song on this guitar, and then I'm going to give it to this guy. Um, it, 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 my issue was the, the whammy bar on yeah, it, the vibrato yeah. system. It was just really uh, – it had a leaf spring, like an old car. Right. And, and that was – how the tension was done, and it it wouldn't come back in tune very well. So pull it out of tune every time. Yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, uh, you could do a little bit of this stuff, but it 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 was it was very iffy. And the bridge itself was something kind of. It had all these little Allen screws. Right, and, right. Uh, you know, it was just and it looked like it'd been kind of punched out on a like somebody in metal shop because right. I had a high school shop. Was it a Bigby you know? or Bigsby? Yeah, and it, yeah. but it had all these little sort of right. kind of World War II looking uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. fixtures. Sure, you know? sure. I mean, I don't. I'm not really putting it down. It's just it was, you know, I was the next generation kid coming along, right? And that just looked kind of old fashioned to me, right? Later, I put a Bixby on there, which was probably from the same era, right? But the engineering was, was a, a little, little better. better, yeah. So that kid must have been happy. I mean, what year was that that you give a kid a guitar? 69, I think. And he, he he was just a kid you saw through the whole run of your shows? Well, you know? he was back, he was hanging in the dressing room. And you know who he was? I know his name now. I don't want to say it because right. it will put un, undue uh, pressure Attention. on the yeah. kid. I'll tell you, his first name was is Sean. Yeah. Um, but he was hanging out, you know, and he he was talking about Clapton and uh-huh. who else would you name around those times, you know, Jeff Beck. And I was telling him stuff like, well, man, you got to listen to the guys that they listen to. Yeah, you know, the Go first back guy. and listen to, you know, uh, Muddy Waters and, and listen to uh, Albert King and B.B. King, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And so uh, the next time he showed up, he had those records. Oh, yeah. The old, yeah, you know, or the next time we played New York. Yeah. Right? And so I, you know, I was really touched that he had taken the time to kind of delve, you know, because he was a kid. He was he was ten years younger than me, so he was just going with what's on the radio right now. And, and I yeah. was kind of giving him a little background, and he, you know, he had done a little due diligence. So I thought I was moved to give him a guitar. <laughs> then we saw him again about four months, three months later, yeah. whatever's the next time we right. played Phil Maurice. Yeah. And, you know, and it turns out, <laughs> well, Eric Clapton had given him a guitar, and BB had given, and Albert had given him a they guitar. Gave him guitar. Oh, he had he gotten guitars out of all these people. You don't know. <laughs> you, I get your con now, kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you you grew up in the not in the Bay Area, but not far, yeah. right? In Bay the area. Bay, right in the Bay Area. In, yeah, I was straight. I you could see the Golden Gate Bridge from uh, roughly where my house was. Although at, in those days, I was kind of in the flats, and I couldn't see anything, but. The house across the street. What town was it? El Cerrito. El Cerrito. He said proudly. Yeah. yeah. When was the first time you started to really uh, soak in music where it made it had an impact on right you? Right around then. Yeah. And what was that music? Well, I remember hearing Red River Valley, and yeah. I'm not sure really who the artist was. Over yeah. the years, I've said Tex Ritter. Other times, I've said Roy Rogers. All I know is I knew that song. Right. And as a kid... Uh, that really meant something. It, 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 it's like I discovered that. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that's still one of my favorite songs. You know, that, that's a great, a great one to be exposed to early. Um, maybe there were other ones, and I just don't remember them. Sure. But that's. But that was the, the one that I stuck. Really remember. And what made you want to pick up a guitar? Well, I, you know, that's an evolution. Yeah. I mean, it, 
I didn't. I'm sure I didn't know what a guitar was then. Or but there must have been a band that made you jump and make you say like well, oh, I, that it was a doable thing. Well, I'm sure like millions upon millions when it kind of connected to me was probably Elvis. Yeah. You know, because um, I wasn't playing yet. When Elvis was on Ed Sullivan, I was 10 years old. Yeah. And I remember finding myself in front of a mirror with a broom right. and making my lip go. Eh, sure. Eh, Snarl it. Like, Snarl it. Yeah, well, yeah. his was actually on the other side of his face, but I... It was a mirror image, so I learned to do this side, <laughs> my right, but it was really his left. No one called you on it, though. Do yeah. it. It's a snare. Yeah. And, but he would, you know, it was just totally, it was James Dean with a guitar. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've skipped one of the things. Uh, besides Red River Valley, yeah. uh, when I was in preschool, my mom yeah. gave me a record uh, and explained to me that that was Stephen Foster. So, you know, it was a two-sided little record, probably yellow or green or something right 45 and i don't even know yeah i don't think they had 45 78 yet. still probably yeah and but it was you know small like yeah, a 45 yeah. she explained to me that uh the writer of the songs was stephen foster that one side was oh susanna the other side was camp down camp town ladies races yeah yeah, Duda, yeah. Duda, yeah yeah you know and so i mean over the years i've just wondered well why did she do that because that's until i got to be no, 11, 12, and she would talk about Irving Berlin or Hoagie Carmichael. You know, I that was that was a singular, alone moment. And when I was about three years old, she's explaining to me a songwriter, right. one of the greatest, you yeah. know, Stephen Foster. Yeah. Um, and so I was shown that some, oh, you mean somebody makes this stuff up? Right. Oh. Oh, right. Well, people you know, I mean, do that. I, I yeah, don't know yeah. what she had in mind or why she did that. I really don't. It's just one of those. Uh, and I think I'm the only kid in the family that she did that to. Huh. Which is also kind of weird. Did you? Uh, were you how, how were you uh, different than the other kids in terms of? Were you musical? Were you? Did you show some? Well, I was. Yeah, I was showing music. Interest. It was just coming out of me. I, I was still in diapers, um, dancing and singing at church. Oh yeah, uh, you know probably everywhere, but sure. I know that at church you're shh, you know shh. Yeah. And they're like they're mortified that I'm making noise, and all the other people go, <laughs> yeah, yeah. giggling. You know, and yeah. I'm singing uh, a song, an old song called "Shoe Fly Pie Apple Pan Dowdy." Make your eyes bug out and you tell me say howdy. <laughs> anyway, uh, cool, cool old song. I think it was Dinah Shore, a matter of fact. Really? Uh, and also there was a the race record of it, which probably was. The ink spots or the mills right. or something. So you remember that separation of? Uh, uh, I didn't know it then. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know anything about that. Right. So yeah. Elvis sort of you know sparked you a little bit. When well, you... I'd had a long by the time Elvis came along. Yeah. Even though I was only about ten. Yeah. Um, I'd had a very liberal musical education by then. I mean, amazing when I think about what happened between when I was born, let's say, and by the time Elvis came along, I knew exactly where he was coming from. Uh, I, I tended to like the people that were... Um, Had an edge to them? Kind of rough and ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I could say I'd seen um, Hank Williams, yeah. but I don't remember that. I, I remember the songs, of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't remember actually seeing Hank. I remember seeing Johnny Cash, though, about 57. He's a profound presence. I mean, when you see him for the first time and you well, feel the I, weight of that... I, I tell people all the time, you yeah. know, I, I, Johnny Cash was on TV. He was all by himself. Right. There was just this guy. It was very dark and moody looking. Yeah. And here's this guy singing, you know, Hockey Book Blues. I mean, he's way lower than that. He's, it's, it's almost haunting. Know? And he was on one of those shows, yeah. you know, like Bing Crosby yeah, or some yeah. of these guys had shows. And they'd have a million dancing girls and outfits and all, you know, cast of thousands on, yeah, the, yeah, on yeah. the, you know, your cavalcade of stars or whatever yeah, yeah. it was. You know, and I, we were used to that being kind of Vegas sure, on sure. television. And then Johnny Car uh, Cash comes on, and he's all by himself. To me, that was way more striking. Oh yeah, way more powerful. Oh yeah, and, and with that voice and that, it was yeah. it was heavy, man. Yeah, I remember. I have very very vague memories when he had a TV show later on. Like I must have must oh, have been you're like remembering the late mid sixties, maybe late late sixties. See that he'd already had a middle period where right. he'd gone away. Yeah, and now he was. Back on top. But I saw that when I was like five or six. You might I have was, seen me on that show. Wow. Is that possible? Yeah. With uh, with Creedence? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we were uh, we were down there. Really, they, 
they Dylan had already taped a show, but they didn't show it yet. Right, it was the first season. Right, they had they had only done a few episodes, and uh, we got to go down there and do Bad Moon Rising. I mean, that was that was amazing to me because here are all these people. You know, John, Johnny, I can say, the buzz was all around him. Yeah, right. He had the, he was. Have you met him before you did the show? No, no, I'd never. Was met it him amazing? That. Were you? Was oh, it? I was blown away. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. walked up at one point and said, yeah. Johnny Cash, I just want to tell you, I love you. Yeah. And then, I, and I was felt embarrassed suddenly, and went, uh, um, I'm, I mean, you know, in my head, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I love you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, he got it though, I mean, right? I hope so. I mean, he was there, were just flying. I mean, in that the dressing room, yeah, right. Here's Mother Maybell and June, and everybody. June was a sweetheart, by mm-hmm. the way. We, we were, uh, I guess we were in the Ryman. Yeah, we were in the Ryman taping that thing. Uh huh. And I remember I was just sitting in a pew, and she comes over. I mean, she was just. Trying to make us feel comfortable and at ease right away. I yeah, mean, yeah. It wasn't like, you know, see my agent. Have yeah. them talk to my publisher. You know, yeah, you know yeah. she came right over and sat down, started talking and all that. She was pregnant wow. with, with their only child, I think. Anyway, in that dressing room, sitting in there waiting to do stuff, besides being shown what a Dobro was firsthand. Oh, um, who played that for you? Tut Taylor. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, he played, he showed long... you how it worked and everything? Yeah, oh yeah, that's why oh. I got one. Oh, they're amazing, So huh? right after that, is, you know, I kind of worked it up for uh, looking out my back door, right? Right, right. But anyway, um, gosh, in that room was Roy Orbison, Carl Perkins, uh, Statler Brothers. They were all uh, there when you were there? Yeah, they're all sitting in the joint. We're, we're, we're telling stories, you know, or I'm hearing stories from the 50s. Wow. You know, all about Elvis and Roy and... Uh, Johnny and Carl all tour in the uh, you know the country with their hit records and, and all you'd, that. You'd covered Roy, not yet, but you you did one cover of Roy song, right? Did Ooby Dooby? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that before you met him or, or after? Uh, that was probably after. I'm gonna say. So were you able but, to? But uh, you know, I mean, Ooby Dooby was one of my favorite. You know, by now Roy was a huge star. He he was already the tail end of the. Big run he had with Pretty Woman and Only the Lonely and all that. You must have been you know, overwhelmed. Glenn Campbell would yeah. come through. He was there too. Glenn on was the too. same episode we yeah, were on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Minnie Pearl, I think, was running around with I her mean, hat, was... and her price tag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole thing. So it was like chaos, but these are all your chaos. A lot of but your these heroes. were like the the kings of of the Country rock and music. roll that I'd grown up. Right, with. right, yeah. right. That must have been overwhelming. Oh, and you, it was amazing. Would you, were you able to talk to anybody? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, no, they were the most down to earth people you'd ever want to meet. I'm quite serious. You know, um, Roy talking all about, you know, basically on tour the same time Elvis is on tour, you know, and uh, Carl Perkins talking about those those times. The too. Sun Record stuff? Yeah. Yeah. And talking, uh, just talking about how the music was made, that sort of thing. Because you, know, you feel was, like, I'm, I'm finally here, man. I'm finally, this is it. Oh, I felt like a little kid. I yeah. Oh, I, yeah. You know, I tend to, that's my personality even yeah. still. Sure. I'll meet somebody that's, you know, 35 years younger than me, and they're, you know, a big star, and I'll just be gawking like a little kid you know and i, I want to i'm that way with brad paisley you yeah know? well you're still a fan show me something you know so, could, how do you do this little thing you know i don't, don't want to learn how to do it so, that, yeah that cut on the new record is crazy that's him on guitar right yeah that is crazy yeah how, oh, he's, he's phenomenal I, I i can't even like i play a little but i'm just a sloppy blues player but when you hear stuff like that you're like oh my god well that's how i felt even as a kid yeah you know when i was little i uh-huh. i always kind of bemoaned the fact that I didn't have like an uncle Harley or something who was had been in a country band, you know, in, in college and, and you know played mandolin and all that stuff, and it could show me that stuff because yeah, yeah. it was always a mystery to me. Right? Um, you couldn't. You weren't. You didn't have the. Well, like, I wanted to, to be able to. I mean, my my. You might say my idol in those days was Chet Atkins. Oh, he's amazing. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in other words, that was within my realm that the stuff I liked. Right. But yet was what I considered the top of the mountain. I, I knew guys that played jazz and classical and, you know, other forms were also really good, but I wasn't interested in that music. You and know, and I, also I, the, the focus it takes to be a virtuoso is different than playing with feeling necessarily. Like, you know, sometimes the, I think you can have both. No, I do too. But like sometimes just the, the raw feeling without complicating it too much is it just moves me. Well, yeah, look, you, you, <laughs> um, <laughs> That that's a good cop out. I, 
<laughs> sure, know. sure it is. But, you know, okay, that, well, I mean, as a guitar I'm player, I'm that's probably use a, a cop cut. out. No, the deal is, so I grew up, um, you know, I would I would study the songs that I could figure out, meaning right. most of them were right. the rock hits. So, you know, all the music of Dwayne Eddy and the yep. Ventures and all the, you know, Honky Tonk even, which... You know, honky tonk. If you're gonna really play, yeah. like that was Billy Butler. Yeah. I didn't know it then, but right. that's an amazing. I, I knew that that whoever that guy was, sure has uh, he has ability and there's subtlety. There's a lot of you know technical yeah. ability there. It's got that and little walk down, dee, 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 you know, yeah, country. Yeah, walk and down. and so I mean, it takes years to really be able to play it like how it's played. I'm talking about the Bill Doggett record, right, right, right. right. Now a lot of rock and roll guys kind of. Let's say straightened it out and played it a little with less finesse and more just raw. The Ventures kind of did that, right. and they put it in the key of E instead of the key of F. Which F is really hard. Um, I'm not so sure that Hon- uh, that Bill Doggett's version, the guy didn't just tune the guitar up to that key. Sure, so, sure, but, hard to know. But I learned it in F. Yeah, you know, it was harder and you know blazes. Yeah. And my little trio in high school, which was the Blue Velvets, yeah. played it in F. Uh-huh. I mean, you know. So you had to keep that bar going the whole time. And yeah, your exactly. Right, Whereas, right, right. you know, the vent- Ventures, when they did it, and every country band in the world, they, do it in they, e. they did it in E. It's a lot easier. And, yeah, what I'm getting at is, because uh, you said something very important, The the put it this way, you're going to move a lot more people if you play with emotion and passion than you are if you play with technical bravado. Right. Uh, it's just the, the nature of the beast, you know, and certainly even still... The thing that gets me first is emotion. You know, if I can hear one a guy play one note like Albert King, right? Exactly. You know, you yeah. close the book and go home because you'll right. never be able to do what he does. Right. Know? But but you <laughs> but you had that you had an, an, uh, but there was still some party that had an insecurity about the virtuosos in the sense. Of I like, wanted that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I would have grown up. I I wished I could have grown up with that in my. Uh, in your family experience, yeah, sure, like some because of, you right. know because that's really the way to do it. You can't you, you, put it this way. I went back. Probably I started in my well. I took up the dobro at the age of forty eight, right, and that was kind of the beginning of okay. Dang it, I've waited long enough. I'm going to figure out how to do these things I've always wanted to do, you know. And there's no more excuses, you know. I it's yeah. I don't have an uncle Harley uh, to show me the banjo and all that. I'm just going to. In other words, in the olden days, to play something that was difficult, even like when I did the the original Blue Ridge Ranger yeah, yeah. thing, I would just kind of make up a part which was over my head and then practice that little part until I could sort of play it uh, authoritatively. But you least, made, but it was yours. You made it up. You made, you know, so yeah, you, yeah. you just applied and yourself. And I mean, that's kind of what I did even on uh, looking out my back door, you know, and so I could play that little part, but I couldn't really play the instrument. Yeah, but but that but you you bring your whole your, your whole sense of emotion and feeling to it. So, you know, the dobro, it's an open tune. You know, you, you can just slide that thing up and boom, you can hit it. That, you know, it, it well, still yeah, but what I'm getting at is so when, at starting at when I yeah, was 48. Yeah. yeah. I decided, okay, I really want to learn how to play this. Yeah, and that means yeah. it's it's a mirror image. It's a reverse of the other way. Sure. I'm going to keep practicing this yeah, thing yeah. until I'm good enough that I can play something. Right. I get um, it. I get it. About halfway through that process, Dobro is an interesting yeah. story. Um, I I was pra- I was well into Dobro. So, to me, some for some reason, it this was the key or a key. And I didn't know what it, I didn't know why or what, but it was a key. Yeah. So I stuck with that. And of course, I was driving my uh, long suffering wife, Julie, kind of crazy. Yeah. She's a Dobro widow <laughs> because, uh, you know, I'd go and I got to practice. I didn't know. And yeah. she goes, oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it sounded like skinning a cat or something. And it's just, why don't you ever play a song? Yeah. Well, no, I got to learn, you know, because I'm trying but, to get the picking exactly. going. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, midway through that, um, process kind of near the end actually um as i was starting to get good enough to actually play something i wrote or i came up with a a cool lick yeah a dobro a dobro lick it was my own lick right and right as the you know there were some kind of occurrences that i used to run away to this place and write songs up at the kern river and one and i'd stay for four or five days and write songs for what was going to be blue moon swamp then I'd come back, you know, and of course Julie and I missed each other, and 
all that. And I, you know, well, she'd say, how you do? And I said, well, I, I got a couple songs, I think, you know. And one time I came home and I had that lick, <laughs> yeah. right? And basically, um, I, you know, I came home, I think, on a Sunday because we're going to take the kids to school the next day. Yeah. And I kind of either laid down and went to sleep or I didn't fall asleep. And the idea for a song came into my head with that lick. Wow. And I'm laying there, you know, with Julie right next yeah, to me. Yeah. And the idea, it was basically the song Joy of My Life, uh-huh. right? And so I, I'm just laying there right after a, a trip I'd had at the Kern River. And basically the whole song, which is kind of what had just really happened. I tiptoed in the room. I know you got to have your rest. That's the, that's the first line of the song. Right. Um, you know, we had little boys and Lindsay, their older sister, who were just kind of all rolling around on the carpet. It takes a lot of energy, especially from mom, yeah. to keep after all that. Yeah, yeah. You know, so she really did have to have, needed her rest. Um, so the idea and a lot of the words for that song came to me while I was laying there in the dark, uh, thinking about that, how we had just seen each other after a week apart or so. And I wrote the song, basically. And I, it's... There was some irony to that in my mind. The next morning, I woke up and realized I, I'd just written a love song. It's really my first love song ever. Oh, I, you know, my, yeah. it's a beautiful love song to my beautiful love, Julie. Right? And she earned it, right? Yeah, but it's just so <laughs> ironic that it's on the dobro. Right. Here's, you know, it's yeah. This thing that was sort of a oh a bone of contention, at least in our in our relationship, you know, why y'all was going off? Oh, you know, yeah. I turned her into a, a Dobro widow. Uh, um, and you made up for it. And well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I sprung it on her at a, at a, a variety show at school. Uh-huh. That's the first time anyone ever heard that song. Oh really? Yeah. In for front the... of a, I asked the, you know, we were doing a little, uh, variety show with, uh, you know, a few musicians and, you know, the, it's all children and their parents out in the audience. And I asked the guys in the, I just want you to leave the stage for a minute and then I played that song to my, excuse me, played that song to my wife, and it was like a pretty incredible moment there for me. Is everybody blown yeah, away? I'm getting a little uh, choked up. Sorry. Oh, no, it's it's nice. a, it was a, you know, she had no idea, uh-huh. so it was pretty cool. Oh, that's great, man. Did she cry? I think so. Oh, I good. did. No, oh, that's sweet. That's sweet. <laughs> so going back um, a bit, you know when. So you were in a band in high school, and that became your first recording band. Yeah, and and that was called the Gollywogs. Uh, well, originally, um, you know, it was it was two guys that were in the same grade as me, Doug Clifford and Stu Cook. That started when we were in the eighth grade, and so I think it was that summer, right after the eighth grade, uh, the guy down at which was basically there's a the building right ac- almost across the street. Uh, right across Potrero Avenue, I guess, in El Cerrito, yeah. uh, was the Boys Club, mm-hmm. the El Cerrito Boys Club. Now it's called El Cerrito Boys and Girls Club. Mm-hmm. Um, but the guy, uh, and I can't, his last name I can't remember, but his name was Bob. And he got wind of this little group of musicians, so he asked us if we would represent the El Cerrito Boys Club to go out to you know other uh, towns around the Bay Area, and represent El Cerrito. And I said, yeah, sure, cool. And so we got to play a lot of these little kind of like county fairs and Uh things like that, meeting other kids from other boys clubs from other towns. Just doing covers. And and, and Yeah, he. I mean, he provided the transportation. He drove us everywhere. Anyway, on one of those places where we played, uh, there was a fellow named James Powell uh, who lived in Richmond, and he was, uh, you know, was in his mid twenties at least. Um, and he approached me one time. He said, "Would you like to make a record?" Yeah. I said, "Cool, sure. How do we do that?" And he said, "Well, I, you know, I, I'm gonna, I've got some songs, and I want to get them recorded." And I think he also knew a guy from Christie Records, which uh-huh. is where Beverly Angel eventually got uh, released. But anyway, so we got to, um, we got to. You know, learn James's song. He had five or six songs that I remember, and every one of them was a girl's name. Yeah. Like the other side of Beverly Angel was Lydia. Yeah. And then he had another song called Martha, My Darling. Yeah. And I mean, you get the drift. Sure. You know? Sure. Um, he, knew so, his, he knew his audience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, anyway, the and it was just classic doo-wop. I mean, he was just right there. If you've ever heard Beverly Angel, I mean, it's it's as cool as really as any of the doo-wop songs, you know, that were huge hits. And that was your first single kind of thing? Well, yeah, I mean, well, it wasn't really. We were the backup band. He I'm said, not sure yeah. it even had. A, I don't know if it had our name on the label even. Mm-hmm. It was James Powell was the yeah. artist, the singer. He wrote the songs. But I was, in effect, the producer. Yeah. You know, uh, I was making sure, especially at the recording session, uh, that things sounded right. And also, um, I I came back later and overdubbed bass, an a actual stand-up string bass. You played it? Yeah, I played it. And, <laughs> I mean, it's a, this is a story I've never told, and I won't make it real long, but basically... I learned that uh, one of the people on my paper route in El Cerrito, and I believe he lived on Norvell Street, was a musician. And there was, um, he was in a country band. He played, actively at least, he played mostly country music. And he talked about some TV show that they recorded every weekend down in Oakland. I remember the name Red something. Yeah. And I don't know who that artist was, but it was a, I don't remember seeing the show. Uh, but he went down there, you know, every weekend and he played. Anyway, I told him about this, you know, recording. And I don't know if I brought it up, if I was that precocious or he volunteered. But somehow I finagled that I was going to get to use his bass. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so uh, he graciously let me take that, you know, and I picked it up in a <laughs> or James picked. We picked it up in a U-Haul trailer. And I mean, open trailer. You know, wrapped the base in blankets the yeah. best we could. Yeah. Drove across the Bay Bridge. <laughs> I mean, with a you know a string base yeah. in the back, um, and went went to the session, and I overdubbed bass on you know both both sides of that single. And you're like what, seventeen? No, I was fourteen. Oh my god, nineteen fifty nine. So you were in. I mean, I, you, I look back at that now, and how precocious was that? I mean, wow. Um, but you just did it, and, and you know what? You want to know what's really. Freaky. What? The guy who recorded us, I'm pretty sure the engineer at yeah. that. Number one, that place where yeah. we recorded is the same place where we recorded Suzy Q. Uh huh. Same recording studio. Same and engineer. And I believe that engineer is the same guy. Guy, His name was Walt Pine. And he was, uh, you know, an old time guy. He was probably in his 60s when I did Suzy Q. So when did you, when you, when you became uh, the, the Gollywogs, or, or I guess when you. Well, when... we were the Blue Velvets all through. High school, right? And, and when did your beyond. brother get involved? Well, Tom was kind of involved off and on with me because we were brothers, sure. you know. So we were, I mean, we both loved music, you know. Um, Tom was a little bit older, so he had made some records or had been on some records before Beverly Angel. I think he had been, you know, he, certainly we had we had made some. Uh, Come in and record yourself for a quarter. You know, those kind yeah, of sure, things sure. where they give you yeah, a little yeah, acetate. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. a real pressing. Right. It was just a little. In those days, it was cheaper to give your reference thing instead of a piece of tape on a reel. Just they give a... you an acetate. That was your. It was like a booth you could go into, right? Kind. Well, this was like we went into. A, we we were hanging out at various little recording studios. Right. Um, sometimes it was their idea. Sometimes it was our idea. You know. Yeah. Um, and you get to record a couple of songs, and it gives the guy that owns the studio a chance to kind of put his stuff through its paces. And your reward was you got to walk away with a little recording you could take home sure. and play till it wore out. You know. Yeah. So when did you when did you guys start when did you start really laying into writing songs and and recording you know full on? Well, that was a, it's a process. I mean, mm. I really started writing songs somewhere around the age of eight. Right. I mean, they weren't good or anything, but I would, you know, I was, I was, oh, I would make a line. Yeah, yeah sure. Then I'd make another line that yeah. rhymed with it, you know. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, just silly kind of stuff. Uh, and then all through my, you know, the my teenage years in high school, uh, I mean, I wrote a song called Have You Ever Been Lonely that was a pretty cool song. Um, Were you lonely? I mean, so, so much. I your- pictured myself a, uh, yeah, I was a loner. Right. And yet I had a lot of friends in high school and stuff, you know, but I mean, it's almost a, it's almost like you're in a movie and, and you're sort of, this is your, the part you've been dealt. Right. You know, cause I felt, I lived in the basement in my house, right? Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, we were kind of in a, 
uh, El Cerrito was like a middle class area. What'd but your dad I, I'd do? say our house. What my was dad your was a uh, printer by trade. Uh-huh. He, for a while, he worked for the Berkeley Gazette, and then uh-huh. he worked for other union guy. I, that I don't know yeah, much yeah. about. Yeah. I just know he was a line of type operator, uh-huh. which has long since been sure. They, they're gone. They got rid of yeah, that yeah. job. That's done. I'm sure I pushed a button or two that I wasn't supposed to, and that's probably <laughs> the end of that. So he was around a lot. <laughs> What's this big cutter yeah. thing, Dad? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get away from that! There goes that page of the paper. <laughs> so was he around a lot? I mean, you guys had no, good... no, no. My parents split up when I was about eight, and he, it basically he was kind of out of our lives. After that, I mean, you know, I, I mean, it was our dad, and for a little while, if there was the weekend thing every, you know, once, sure, and sure, but that kind of petered out pretty quick. Um, so you feel then like my dad moved up to Santa Rosa, which is north of yeah, San Francisco yeah. or El Cerrito, and so I'd go up there in the summertime, yeah. and stay. I, um, I'm not sure if Jim, the the oldest, went there, but me and Tom and the younger brothers went up there and i i remember cause I, I only bring that up really because i got a job uh at the Hillsburg beach yeah um for a few summers as a result of my dad uh living up there yeah and in fact the first record i ever bought on my own was there yeah uh, it was the summer of 56 and elvis's album had you know elvis was big on the radio and i walked three miles or whatever to the record store to get Elvis's album, but it was sold out, and I had my four dollars and twelve yeah. cents, so I bought the Bill Haley album. So uh-huh. that ended up being my first uh, record. That Rock I around the clock. Yeah, yeah. I, had, I had bought a couple of records, but they were for Christmas presents for my brothers. So your first album was Rock Around the Clock. Your first yeah. record. Yeah. Was it the whole record or just the? Single? Yeah, the album. Oh wow. Yeah, and you know, looking and then I went back the next week. And uh, got Elvis's record. So know. those were it. Those are, well, that's the beginning well, of rock and roll, right there, right? Yeah, especially the Bill Haley thing. Bill Haley, as you know, it was sort of he had an odd career because he was, you know, kids are kind of a funny brew. Um, Bill Haley's music was just a little bit older. It was more sophisticated than Elvis. I mean, I sure. tended to. You know, Elvis was really raw and and cool. Well, it, it almost felt like he came out of the big band thing. Well, he did. Yeah, he was yeah. twenty nine years old. Right, old. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, and they dressed in kind of plaid coats and all. It was from another era, and especially the guitar playing was phenomenal. I mean, literally, it took me until about ten, maybe even less, uh, years ago before I could finally play the solo on "Rock Around the Clock." Yeah, that's a tricky one. Well, it's very advanced. Well, you know what's yeah. amazing about those you know, about your old records, those those fantasy records. Yeah. What, despite whatever you know your 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 issues with them were, is that those things are thick. They hold up like I, it's amazing. Oh, like, I mean, I, the, the vinyl, the actual itself? vinyl. I wanted because you were talking about that. Um, w- number one, uh, when my album um, Blue Ridge Rangers yeah. was going to come out way back in seventy three. Uh, the the pressing was how can I say it was uh, defective. Yeah, there was this thing on it. That, right, right. It was kind of a a, a it was a berm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I actually had people coming walking up to my knocking on my front door with their little kid, little eight year old Johnny, and the dad is saying, "Well, there's this thing on the record, and it's, it hops <laughs> and skips. Yeah, you know, and you know, it's a it's about the size of a walnut. You know, and they, yeah. I mean, basically." The they consumer to coming it? to the <laughs> producer and complaining, you know, <laughs> instead of complaining to Saul frickin' Zantz. Yeah. Right? And so I I took it to heart. I said, well, shoot. You know, maybe, you know, maybe my record would do better, number one, if it wasn't defective. Right. So I kind of got way into this thing, went down to uh, uh, RCA Victor where they were um, pressing, pre- you know, pressing, yeah. the, you know, and, and all that was done there. And I mean, all do all during the credence time, I had gone down there to actually master the vinyls, right? Uh, I mean, I was present when this happened. Okay, so now uh, I've gone down and uh, I've determined that you know this is kind of a secret thing. Remember, Elvis had a his Aloha from Hawaii was sure. just out, whatever, yeah, yeah. right? And so I learned that there RCA at the time, and if you used their services, it would be what you could get too. They had four different grades of uh, vinyl. Four, there were four different levels. Right. 
Elvis got the very highest grade for right. that album. Although you know that yeah. was Elvis. Uh, yeah. And guess which grade my record was being printed on? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, God, dang, you know. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I wanted to say about that was, um, I think when Pendulum came out, they had come out with a new. Remember, this, this was the only medium then. There right. was there, there was no, there CDs, was no, no cassettes, other no thing. Nothing. It was just right. vinyl records. Right. And so um, they had come out with a new high grade. They said flexible vinyl. Right? right, and it showed a picture of somebody in Life magazine or one of those taking their LP and going whoop and and holding it, you know, in one hand, kind of bent over like a like a bonnet or something. Right. right? Well, <laughs> I started getting letters from fans of Creed and said, "I tried what I saw. It it broke. It cracked. <laughs> you know, I want my money it, back." Well, it they... turned out it was the same thing. It it really wasn't that the vinyl was more flexible. It's just that they were now. Saving pennies by using less. Right. So it was skinnier. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were turning, in other words, a cheap ass, uh, you know, um, uh, economic move into a marketing ploy. They say, see, oh, it's right, more right. flexible. But it was garbage. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go through, like, the new CD, <laughs> this one that, the, the one that just came out, uh, I wrote a song for everyone, wrote a song for everyone. You collaborate with some pretty amazing people, and you made certain choices. I imagine you chose these songs. No. You didn't? <laughs> No, I cho- here, here's how it all started. Yeah. I'm sitting in our family room, basically with my family. Yeah. And Julie, my wife, just suddenly turns to me and she says, why don't you get a whole bunch of the people you love yeah. and sing your songs? Right. I mean, she said it as simply as that. Yeah. And that ignited a fire in my imagination. I mean, to me, basically, I, Christmas, you know, I yeah. looked at that. You mean I get to call up Brad Paisley? Whoa, this would be so much fun. I mean, it was basically, she was saying, you know, people you love. It it doesn't have to be that I knew them, because most of the people I didn't know. Right. But um, it was people whose music I loved. Right. And then in all cases, people that I've been collecting their records for a long, long time, following their careers, right? Yeah, yeah. And when she, I mean... It's how can I say it? It was genius, you know. Instead of some record company guy saying, "Well, why don't you get the top ten or the top three artists in each genre?" What do they call that? There's a there's a military word uh, where it goes across logistics, uh-huh. something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, this was not that. This right. was my wife saying to me, "Why don't you get people that you love and sing your songs?" Yeah, it's just. It just sounded like a great, fun it's a, idea. It, so it's a, it's a great so album. So the premise became, yeah. as I talked more you know, over the next few days yeah. and, and time forward with Julie, basically, well, we'll contact the artists, see if they'll do it or not. You know, obviously, all the people here are the ones who said yes. There were some others who, uh, by because of scheduling and you know, all other reasons, yeah. uh, couldn't, couldn't be present. But once uh, somebody did say yes, the first thing I said was, okay, now you choose the song you want to do. Really? Yeah. That's And beautiful. then the second thing I said was, now, I want to, after you've, you know, go ahead. You don't have to tell me right now. Think right. about it. Yeah. And then when you've decided on a song, let's talk about the arrangement. I want you to, you know, come up with your vision. Have some kind of something that you want to do you know let's let's don't just re-record the old record right. over again who needs that right right I, I, my idea was let's make some new music in other words let's have fun and be creative well that's the amazing thing about your songs is that they're they're timeless and there's very few people that have achieved that that you can take any john fogarty song and you you let someone else arrange it or you even play the originals and it stands outside of time and they're, they're they're constantly new. I mean, I listen to your music, you know, yesterday, today, and and it doesn't have any date on it. It doesn't. You can listen to it at any time, and it's just as fresh as it was when it first came out. And that's a brilliant, amazing thing, and it's a gift. And I don't. I I hope you know that. <laughs> well, I, I I hear that from other people, and then you know, and I and I kind of absorb that and go well. You know that's really neat that they say stuff like that. Um, but you know songs that are well, dated and from the. Uh, you mean itsy bitsy teeny weeny? No, I mean book. even <laughs> even rock around the clock, man. I mean rock around the clock is a period piece, and you know well, if you, that's because of um, Vic Morrow. Yeah, and, you know the original Blackboard Jungle, right? And then. Um, 
But even the, the bonds, the, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, that's true. Yeah. That's true. But there was a style to it. But like when you like on this on the new yeah, record. Yeah, I mean, be, well, you know why? Because Rock Around the Clock does its that sort of. I mean, it was it was actually a little old fashioned, even when it was a hit. Right. That was right. Kind of like a Tommy Jimmy Dorsey arrangement from the forties, if you think about it. Yep. Um, you know that could probably still be made new. Um, well, we don't have to challenge anybody you know, to do that. I think what I'm getting at is I see it from my side of uh, the perspective, I guess you'd say. Um, while I was writing the song, of course, uh, my wife and I just talked about this a couple of days ago because I heard something on the radio that was, eh, I, I told her, honey, that's that's the kind of thing I always call the sideways song. <laughs> and she said, what do you, she said, what do you mean? It's horrible. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I, I won't tell you what we were hearing. Yeah. And I just said, um, yeah, it, you know, you you, it's got some nice little parts in it, and you can kind of see what maybe inspired them to start doing the song. But then they kind of wimped out; they didn't go any further, and so they're just doing that thing, and it's getting really monotonous to hear that over and over. Which right. I said, in my case, two one of two things would have happened: I'd have been pushing myself to try and make this thing better. You know, go on, move from that part, and go to another part. Or halfway into the song, I would have realized this is a dead end. I'm stuck. This is, this is going to be no good, period. I'm going to not, you know, and I might have spent a week on it. Yeah. which happened all the time back in the day. So, but I would realize at some point, it's a, this is a dead end. It's not going to be good. I can't make this song turn out good. It's, it's, it's going to crash. So you're very hard on yourself. And I, yeah, and so I have to close the door and allow my you know, brain to be free. Maybe at some day in the future, some little snippet will you know, back and, out. And I'll move on. But I realized that, that was, it was just a dead end because I want to make a better song than that. Well, right? let's, I, let's just, go, I want my song well, to be better than what that is. And, that, and only you know what that is. Well, I, that you know, I haven't always succeeded, Mark. I mean, don't, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say everything I did was wonderful because well, it wasn't. If I but go, at least, you know what? There, there. At least to be a musician, and certainly to be any kind of writer, yeah, you know, any kind of writer, yeah, or certainly an artist that paints and you know those sort of things, playwright, whatever. You got to be honest to yourself. You, you really do. Otherwise, you're sitting there and everything you do is wonder. Oh, I'm wonderful. Isn't this wonderful? Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, that's not true. Yeah, you I mean, can't believe it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. You, you got to look at it and go, oh, that yeah, yeah, stinks. Yeah. Why is that, you know, lame? And you got to be brutal enough to, to tear it apart and try to make it better. So on the first album, you know, you did the, you did, I put a spell on you, mm -hmm. which was a, that's a, that's an eerie song. That's a great song. It's a great song, yeah. but it, it's kind of heavy. In a way, yeah, like, I, okay. there, well, there's something like sometimes when I listen to the, the, your records that, you know, they're, they're, they're almost they got some mystical element. There's a little darkness underneath there. Sure. Absolutely. And and you feel that, right? Uh, that's why I love them. <laughs> <laughs> and Susie Q became a huge hit. Right. Now, yeah. when what, what was the first time like the, the, the first song that you wrote? Personally, that became a huge hit was Born on the Bayou or which one or Proud uh, Mary? Proud Mary. And that thing is a, a masterpiece yeah. and because i feel that there's a there's an urgency and there's a certain menace to to your voice that just plows into your head in a great way now do you can you identify where that comes from um well a simple answer is growing up hearing incredible voices on the radio and the records i would buy yeah if you're speaking strictly of of the vocal part right i mean i grew grew up one of the people i really loved was howlin wolf right oh and yeah i just you know i mean it, it's very it's very obvious even it's very pretty clear uh in my some of my vocals that uh i was very influenced by howlin wolf um you know some of the other great soul singers uh of that time um uh, god who, wilson pickett you know guy i mean little richard obviously yeah, yeah. you know they, yeah. they had that uh they had a thing in their voice that was more than just singing good and like bing crosby my mom loved bing crosby and i grew to really love bing crosby too yeah um and of course that would be called singing you know that was that was really great art um but when somebody could insert that other thing uh, put it this way, 
Bing Crosby's fans would never allow that. Right. And I'm sure his record company wouldn't have either. That right. Was, you know, that was a different audience. Yeah. But um, the thing that Little Richard had and, and Howlin' Wolf, you know, when they'd, when they'd put that extra edge in their voice and yet still sing... Uh, the way the way Wilson Pickett did it, he, he, it was basically screaming in tune. Yeah, you know? right. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I just really loved that, and so I kind of I went after that. I mean, I was this little white kid from uh, middle class El Cerrito. It, it kind of I wasn't I, well, I wasn't born there, but um, in a sense, though, I think how can I say it? I created my own environment. Or the environment was there. All I had to do was let it uh, be revealed to me. You know, meaning when I would hear Howlin' Wolf or Little Richard uh, or a, a lot of other guys that I really loved their voice and try to get, you know, try to be, emulate those people, try to be like that. And when you did, like, on the on, on Green River, when Bad Moon Rising came out, and, yeah, because what Fortunate Son came out later, but when did you start to realize that, you know, that you were becoming somewhat of a, a, a voice for the Vietnam War era? Um, boy, it's, an, it's interesting. You know, put it this way. The, the first album, which had Susie Q on it, and by the way, even though I wrote some songs on that record, or at that album, uh, you know, Susie Q and I Put a Spell on You and 99 and a Half, were certainly the best songs on that album. I listened to 99 and a half over and over again. <clears throat> yeah, I mean it was it was my songs were were and Por, I think Porterville's on that album. Yeah. Um my song my song writing was right on the edge between the guy who wrote teenage love songs when I was in high school sure. and the guy who was going to figure out a way to apply his brain his 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 feelings his even his own philosophy you know what he was seeing in the world to somehow incorporate that into a into the song yeah like, you know having grown up through the the first wave of the rock and roll era you're sort of emulating and of course the r&b era too uh you're emulating your heroes and yeah they were all kind of uh tin pan alley right. songs about fairly normal subjects um, Pro- Porterville, by the way, on that album, though that that was a song that started while I was in the army, um, in my on my active duty in the army, and you, were you drafted or you joined? I up? was no, I was drafted. Yeah. No, I, there was no way I would have joined. I mean, my I was very anti, like most people in my generation. Most guys, uh, Vietnam did not as as a let's go get them. You know, Wasn't it did there. not resonate right. with my generation. We right. we really kind of saw it as uh, a tragedy, you yeah. know, to say it in simple terms. It, no one could really figure out, well, why are we there? What are, yeah. what are we fighting? What is right. it? What's it? You know, and, and as Nixon uh, got elected and, and became the guy in the White House right. who who was even more simpatico with all the big business and all that, right. I mean, it, it started, if you were paying attention, it became very clear that hey, this war isn't about patriotism and and you know Defense. my country and all right. that it's about money it's, right. bu- it's business in other right. words they're basically sacrificing the young men and women of my country for business interests how wank is that that right. stinks right you know but they had a draft then so they could come grab you against your will and i mean that was the huge difference between vietnam and iraq and you didn't end up going to I vietnam. didn't go to vietnam no i stayed in this country but anyway so during the time i was on active duty um a lot of your day would be spent marching out on a parade field. You know, it's this big square mile of asphalt somewhere where it was 115 degrees and because they didn't know what to do with you, but they couldn't leave you just sitting around sleeping. Yeah. So they would um, march you. You'd go out and you'd march for like three or four hours in a day. I mean, to, frankly, I was delirious half the time, right? Yeah. And there i remember a couple of things one was i would ha- you had to spit shine your boots right had to shine them up to a mirror shine and while i was marching around there'd be this one thumbprint or fingerprint on my otherwise glossy uh, toe of my boot you know and it would be there kind of like a little devil a little you know gremlin <laughs> yeah, yeah. in in my mind yeah. i'm seeing this one smudge uh, thumbprint on my sh- spit shine uh, boot and it's going ha 
and yeah. I try to wipe it, you know, away in my mind. It would just move over, and I, oh, no, 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 you know, and you're marching along too. Hey, or yeah. and some guy going, you know, yeah, yeah. they all talk about Jody all the time, yeah. by the way. Anyway, so that was one thing that was going on in my head. And the other thing was this narrative about my childhood. And I began to realize I was writing a song and didn't even know it. And I, I was talking about my dad, uh, somehow that I, that he was sort of from the wrong side of the tracks. I was therefore the the next of kin and the wrong side of the tracks because I kind of felt that way as a kid. We yeah. were sort of lower middle class. So don't get me wrong; I never starved or anything. Right, right. Always had shoes. Yeah, uh, you know. Um, but it still, it was just sort of a a lot of a lot of teenage a lot of kids feel that way anyway. Right. I certainly had a lot of uh, trouble with acne, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awkward with girls, you know. Yeah. I mean, the whole normal teenage thing. Right, right. And uh, so I began to put it into this song, just kind of not so much incidences, but the emotion. Right. It was it was a pretty punk song, way ahead of its time. This is Porterville? And, yeah, Porterville. Yeah, yeah. And so um, all those days and weeks we were marching around, I was creating Porterville. What I didn't realize, I was because you asked about <clears throat> in a in a kind of sideways way, you asked about storytelling, mm-hmm. and that one was really the first one. I, I you know it, it became instead of "I love you, Marie. Why did you break my heart? I'm as sad as can be." Right. Da da da. You know. Yeah. Uh, part somewhere. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and instead, I was telling this cool story, and and when I got home, I. I I don't think I ever wrote it down until I, when I got home and I started getting serious about writing, and I realized it was kind of a cool little. It was it was just different. It yeah. was different than the usual right boy girl and broken sure, heart sure, thing. Sure, sure, sure. Um, then Proud Mary, as you know, became really the first really good song right. that I wrote, and so that's that was a to me was a big accomplishment just to get there, and then again as, with a story. Yes. Yeah. Right. It was to get to where I, I sort of had, now I had that in hand. I real, I kind of was starting to know what I was doing, sort of. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And as I did that, I began to reflect that, wow, I can write about something. I can tell a story, but I can have a point of view. Yeah, I can yeah. say, I, I can kind of put up an example and then have a, use that example about, you know, what I've pointed out. And have a point of view about that. that. I mean, that's precisely what Fortunate Son is. Because, you know, what was really pissing me off about that was you'd see all these guys that were the basically the kids of well-heeled people, whether they be millionaires or, uh, you know, businessmen, in other words, yeah. or sons of politicians, you know, and they weren't going to Vietnam. Right. They probably weren't having to go anywhere. Somehow they had, what do they call those things, uh deferrals yeah exactly yeah uh where they were uh they were out they weren't in the military or if they were they got a desk job somewhere right you know? so i you know i realized i could write about that and point out the glaring examples you know the flaws without naming any names but these were things that we all knew at the time and it also is not hung on any era that's always going to be the case Fortunate son is always going to be the story. Well, because that's it is what it is. That's isn't exactly it? right. Yeah. And so there was a there's a certain amount of rage in that song. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it's not. It is about the war, of course, but right. it's more about privilege, right? And the inequality of the classes. You know, where uh, basically the rich men, de- you know, declare the war, and then the poor men have to fight the war. Exactly. Now with Bad Moon Rising, that was not specifically a war song. No, not at all. <clears throat> I actually got the idea from an old black and white movie called The Devil and Daniel Webster. But I was hooked on the phrase bad moon rising. Yeah, yeah. Uh I mean I mean it was a phrase that I just sort of I don't know, conjured up, I guess. Um you know, there was a lot of talk back in the late sixties about it was a lot of astrological stuff. People walk up to you and they, they do the peace sign to you and then somebody'd actually say, What's your sign, man? You know, and I'd usually lie. I'd I'd say uh, Aquarius. Go, yeah, I knew it. I knew uh, it. You know, I mean, it was you know, that's was how bogus it. It all seemed kind of. But was there a difference between? I mean, did you associate? Did you identify with the hippies, or were you? Yes just, and no. Actually, uh, philosophically, very much. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, um, 
<laughs> the idea of uh, certainly being a liberal person uh, is who I am, uh, thinking that we have a, an obligation to our fellow man, uh, the idea of trying to care for the less fortunate. Uh, you know, these were all pretty much liberal Democrat precepts, at least in the 50s and 60s right. when I grew up. Yeah, um, Things have gotten a lot more blurred over time. You know, I, I'd still loosely call myself a Democrat, but, you know, I realize I'm kind of a lot more like some kind of libertarian or something. Yeah. You know, um, I still feel you... <laughs> I made the mistake of not voting in the mainstream a couple times, and of course that meant my vote got thrown away, and the guy I really hated got elected because sure. I threw my vote away, right. and a bunch of other people felt like me. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had that happen in our history, uh, in our recent history. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but yeah, I, 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 I very much agreed with the the hippie philosophy, if that's what you want to call it. I mean, anything Pete Seeger would say, that's where I'm at. Um, but the lifestyle, you know, the idea of being stoned all day and laying around and thinking that somebody else is going to take care of you, you know, I yeah. had a big argument with a guy while I was in the Army. He said, oh, no, I mean, I'm going to move to the desert and I won't have to do anything. And I said, well, everybody else is going to have to pay your way, man. You know, the army's protecting you, the police, the welfare that's going to bring you food. That ain't right. Oh, well, man, I'm just going to, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I've always thought you're supposed to take care of yourself and, and bring yourself up by your bootstraps. I think that's my parents' generation teaching right. me. Right. Um, but the idea that we're obligated to our fellow, I mean, obligated, that we need to do something is certainly ingrained in me. I just, I just didn't think personally the lifestyle of, uh, you know, eyes glazed over and and just kind of being unkempt and yeah. lazy. I, I didn't like that. Right. So, "Bad Moon Rising" is an apocalyptic song. Uh, yeah. It, it to me, it was just the idea. Yeah. And and how it's did... scary in that way? You know, it's, it... it's it was it was basically, you know, it's it's not really a protest song at all it's more you know these these great forces happen in our lives that are beyond our control i mean to me the that metaphor in that movie because the the star or the hero in the movie sells his soul to the devil right. yeah and then there's a gigantic hurricane you know destroys everybody else's uh, crops and farms and everything and yet he's saved yeah you know it's just that image after he spends the night cowering in his barn and all these noises outside, and he comes out and his land is perfectly protected, you know. And it, wow, that was scary. But of course, in the movie, he starts to have second thoughts about eternity, and he he <laughs> hires, I think, Daniel Webster to, to defend, argue his right. <laughs> get him. No, no, you didn't see this phrase, Mister Devil. You see the fine print. He <laughs> he doesn't owe you his soul and ten masters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, but that that song got that got co opted by the the Vietnam generation. There was a that that thing you wrote about uh, that that moment you had with that vet who talked to you about the song. I found that very powerful. Oh, when he came up to you and he said uh, that that well you know, that, that, he, that was that was uh, in what happens is when you're an you know a record maker or making any kind of art, yeah. you you make it within yourself for maybe for a certain purpose or a certain reason and then once it goes out there into the public you really aren't in control of it anymore sure and it can be uh interpreted in a lot of ways and then even uh adopted or adapted in a lot of different ways uh I, I, a lot of my songs had that happen to them what that and guy that, say to you and that's all cool stuff well what what happened in the case of this song it was um it's one of the most profound moments in my whole life, really, because because it was so deep into another person's reality that I I didn't live. I I didn't. Uh, I, I was told about it later, and because of the person's enormous sacrifice. Well, what did he say? What happened was um, the little school where my kids were going to school was having a fundraiser, you know, like all school little yeah. schools do, private school. Yeah. And so Julie had thought it'd be, a, my wife, had thought it'd be a cool thing for me 
to donate something that could be, you know, auctioned. Right. And that would help raise money. Um, so I wrote out the words to Bad Moon Rising and signed it and, you know, donated that. And <laughs> But my handwriting is really horrible. I mean, like a third grader. And so I was, you know, it came the night of the event and, and uh, I went to school with my family and I, you know, walked over to the place where they had my my effort hanging on a wall, you know, because I, I was very concerned about my chicken scratch. Yeah. And I walked over, you know, just looking at it and kind of cringing. And then I, I think I, for a moment I went, yeah, yeah, OK, it, it's not it's not as bad as I had made it out to be. And I noticed somebody has walked up and is standing next to me because, uh, you know, I was really only going to be there like 30 seconds. And, you know, a voice says, John. And I turned around and I said, yeah. And it's a uh, nice looking guy, uh, about my age, maybe a little younger. Yeah. Uh, dressed nice. You yeah. know, he'd come. And it wasn't somebody I knew as one of the parents at school. Yeah. But he's dressed in a, in a suit and tie, you know, very, uh, what's the word, uh, deferential to the ev- event that was yeah. being put on. Right. And he says, well, uh, you wrote Bad Moon Rising, didn't you? And I said, yeah. He says, oh, I want to tell you something about it. I said, okay. And I look at him, and he says, uh, well, I was in Vietnam. And I looked at him. And, you know, now it's because of the special place that all of that is in my heart and, uh, you know, what we all lived through uh, and certainly all the uh, experience I had and all the, the music I made and the, just the, the struggle, the social upheaval of those days and those times. Uh, he really had my attention because now I realize this this was – beyond where we were now standing right right? and he says well i want to tell you about your song while i was in vietnam he said um me and me and my buddies were uh you know we had a patrol there and we were in the camped in the jungle he said our mission was to uh, seek out and go find charlie and uh, you know right away my, my brain is remembering those times you know i'm that it's the craziness of how that war was uh, put forth, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the enemy is on his own turf in the jungle, and we're in there as you know campers, uh, <laughs> tourists, basically, because we don't live that way, and we're supposed to go find him, right? Yeah. Well, anyway, so this fellow says, uh, so my unit, our, our mission, you know, our orders were to go find Charlie in the jungle, and... Part of our orders were we were to go at night. And I'm going, <laughs> you know, I look at him and I shake my head. Oh, my God. Yeah. And uh, he says, so what we had to do, you know, every night after it got dark, we'd have dinner. He says, then, he says, the idea was we were supposed to go out into the jungle. He said, you know, it's just my little patrol. We called ourselves the Buffalo Soldiers. Yeah. And I thought, really? He says, well, you know, we were... I said, I mean, in my mind, I, without verbalizing, I knew that that's a sign of bravado. You're sort of hoisting yourself up against this almost suicidal uh, mission that you're on. And he says, uh, so we would turn on all the lights in our encampment. We had this PA system. And so we would turn it up as loud as we could. And we would play Bad Moon Rising at the top you know the highest volume we could play just before we went out into the jungle and i said you're telling everybody that you're coming out into the jungle and he said yeah that's right i just i just looked at him in awe you know and i said wow i'm glad you made it through um i wish i could tell you the man's name because he's a hero in uh, my mind and certainly one of the more important guys i've ever met you know i Kind of turned away. I think we shook hands. I turned away and looked at the thing on the wall. When I looked back, he was gone. Oh. And it was just, you know, one of those things. How can I say it? it? If you think about that, even for thirty seconds, you realize that so many people, so many millions, really hundreds of thousands, at least, of soldiers' stories that lived through that time. That they were given a wacky set of instructions that they had to do. And so they they did the best they could. Yeah, and that then that was you had no no idea that that could have been until that guy told you. You had no idea that that your song was just out there, right? And that platoon drew strength, you know. From well, I always remember that that yeah. he was a Buffalo soldier. I mean, that that was some guys with their own 
their own official, uh, you know, how yeah. you make it, right? Sure. They realized that they were an island in eternity, basically. I mean, it, that's what you are, you know? They've, they've sent you over there for this crazy thing. You can't really um, refuse or they'll put you in the penitentiary, uh, you know, and you'll be shamed. Yeah. The, the horrible thing about all of that was that uh, w- w- the American public wasn't smart enough yet that when those guys came home, of course, they were all treated horribly. The the public at large was against the war, but the administration at the time managed to join the concept, uh, the clash of ideolo- ideologies together so that it made people think they were against the soldiers, and they were not. They were against the policy. These poor soldiers were just simply doing what their country asked them to do. But the the insane administration was using their best uh, PR people, I guess, sure. you know, like Halderman, yeah. uh, to put the disease on the soldiers. It's, it's such an unfair Horrible. thing. Horrible. Yeah. And the, and the other songs on here that, like, let, uh, we'll just go through a couple of them. Like, the uh, uh, Long As I Can See the Light um, always chokes me up. And the, I think that the My Morning Jacket did a beautiful version of it. Thank you. Did you? Yes. Oh, I love it. Where did that song come from, man? Um, I think that was that, that loner, again, that I kind of mentioned. Um, I think I've always kind of ha- just had that feeling that, um, I wished so desperately for home, you know, uh, when we were, when we were kids, the, I mean, there was, how can I say it? Television or escapist, uh, entertainment is full of, uh, little touchstones yeah. of this stuff in the fifties, of course, with TV, um, there'd be shows like leave it to beaver. Uh, maybe the the old movie Old Yeller, yeah, you know where you you get this sense of a very strong home, right? Even if you really didn't have that yourself, yeah, yeah. But you just desperately wanted that, right? Yeah. And so my idea was um, a candle in the window, yeah. That's you know it's certainly a fragile thing, yeah. That any little wind can blow it yeah, out, yeah, yeah. And the idea that I would be able to find my home and get back home no matter how lost i might be as long as that candle was in the window do you I, and now i do want to tell you yeah. <laughs> even the man that wrote that song was a pretty sad man internally um that man being you at a different time yes and i am i found my home my beautiful wife <laughs> julie uh gave me that what was so what? that song is has a wonderful how can i say it? i mean it's it's there was so much desperation in that song and now i can of course it's a struggle that now i'm 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 proud of the song but i'm also proud that uh at least i found my salvation where was the sadness coming from then uh, all my life my Bec- whole life do you think it has something to do with your old man splitting yeah of course yeah oh absolutely yeah i i felt like uh uh, a stone cast adrift, you know, just yeah. kind of with no moorings. Yeah. And then you wrote the other song that directly, uh, you know, sort of approaches that, which uh, someday never comes, right? Mm-hmm. And that, you know, that can be looked at, just the language of that song, like this is a, with a lot of your songs, that the language is is powerful, but not directly hinged to, you know, a, a, a personal experience in the song, so it can apply to anybody. Like in the sense of someday never comes. I mean that 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 heartache of that song can be applied to anybody's experience, but it's very specific for you. Well, it was personal. Um, I was breaking up with my wife yeah. at the time. This was 1972, I believe, and of course we had children. And the phrase it it was something my dad would say or my parents would yeah. say. Um, they would say, "Oh, someday." Yeah. You know, I'd hear uh, someday or someday you'll understand or someday, yeah. so, right? And so there's, I, I, I don't know how in, you know, this is a songwriter and a and a poet at heart, I guess, um, because now I, I really, it's amazing that I came up with that title, Someday Never Comes, because it's an angry statement. Yeah. Because my parents said it to me, and basically I'm, 
the man who's grown now, the child who's now a man, and I'm saying it to my child. And it, it's just, that's so sad to me. It's just yeah. horribly sad. But I'm angry at the, let's say, fairy tale I'd been given as a child. Someday you'll understand. That's, you don't. Yeah. You know, there, you, you never come to understanding. You come to, that's the way it is. Except you don't, yeah, but you don't, you accept only because uh, you're older. You yeah, know? and you don't want to be I bitter. Go, if somebody tells me, uh, you keep thinking someone's going to leave a toy for you down on the sidewalk where the path of your house meets the sidewalk. And uh, you think somebody's going to leave a toy there. And every day you run down there and you look for your toy, you know, for 15 years. <laughs> yeah. But the, no one ever leaves a toy there. Every single day, you you know, at some point, damn, you know, this, that's the people that call in uh, radio psychiatrists. And the, the yeah, shrink yeah. is saying, you need to <laughs> move on here. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, yeah. no, no. Someday there's somebody's going to leave a toy for me. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. he's saying, someday never comes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Anyway, the, uh, I mean, I came up with that, that phrase, someday never comes. It's an angry, that's anger. Yeah. You know, because it never comes, no matter what your parents told you. And it's not true. It, someday never comes. Well, the anger thing, I mean, this is something you've had to deal with your entire life. I mean, you, you know, when I when I read yeah. about yeah, yeah, <laughs> but when I read about you and and what you guys and what you went through with with Fantasy Records and with Saul Vance Ants and that whole thing, I mean, a good chunk of your life was fighting for your own work. Yep. And 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 finally, you got resolution around that. Well, the only <laughs> the only it, it's really not, Mark. Um, what it is is, in other words, I never got. I don't own my songs. So that's not resolution. If I live if I live long enough, I'm going to get them back after a long, long time. Um, How did that happen? Um, here's the simple the simple truth: you have a little band, yeah. right? None of, none of you has been within a million miles of any sort of fame or making it or yeah. money, right? Right? You're you're like every other want to be you know so you have a dream and oh i hope i have a hit song someday and all that sort of thing um you know but you're so far away. you have no reason to believe other than having a dream right because you know as you look around all the other people that show up at the little uh engagements you play in some little you know uh, high school gymnasium or maybe a uh little sock hop after school or a cl nightclub on the outskirts of Sacramento, not even downtown Sacramento. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're so far away from, you know, you're playing out, uh, out in all the little farm towns, like in California, you're in Merced and Turlock and Hanford and uh, beautiful places, by the way. I, I, as I grew up, I, since I played there so much, it's a lot of that informs, the music and the kind of writing I do. Um, but you know that everybody else you're seeing that has their little musical group or comic group or, or uh, you know, whatever part of showbiz they're in, they all have the same dream. Yeah. So you have no really more reason to expect anything ever happening than all, you know, you just look at sure. the odds. Everybody's right? playing guitar in the garage. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, so, and there's been no... Other than your own passion, there's been no really um, reason to believe. So you have your little four-piece band, and you have a guy who has a little record company. I mean little, a little jazz record company that has, I think, 27 albums by Cal Jader on yeah. it. And because I was a shipping clerk at that record company, I know how few records they actually ship. Yeah. Because I was the guy that had to put them in boxes. <laughs> yeah. You know, and they were lucky to ship 300 records a week. That right. would be a big week. Right. Right? Yeah. And I, I had that job for a couple of years. Um, and so as you look around these, the five of you, and you all have, you're talking about this dream, and you're all talking about it like you're equal. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're all in this together, boy. If we ever, if we ever manage to hit the big time, boy, We'll we'll all you know be on the good side of the on the the wealthy side of the street. You know, yeah. the gold will finally come to us. We'll we'll share and share alike. I mean, everybody's talking that way. Yeah. And so, as you see your bandmates and this guy who 
owns this little tiny, tiny record label, you believe that to be true. And when you sign uh, a, a contract that says uh, you're all sharing uh, or he's owning the songwriting and the arranging and he's uh, owning the the masters and all that. Not that I really even read the thing. Right. Um, but you talk about it verbally. And one of the questions was asked, well, how about if we ever, you know, make it? I mean, we have a hit record. And then the man who owns the label says, oh, we'll tear this thing up and we'll all share in this equally. Well, you're all sitting in the exact same boat. You believe that. You think that's the truth. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, if you ever see the movie The uh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, once there's money involved, things change really radically. When there's no money, there's nothing to share. Right. Nothing to split up. Yeah. Hey, man, I'll give you here you're on the turn. You're playing poker, you know, yeah, like yeah, a yeah. virtual poker. Yeah, hey, yeah. I'll bet you 50 percent of my share. Yeah. Whatever. It's worth yeah. nothing. Right. 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 I mean, you're kind of talking that way because you all have a dream. Right. You, right. And, and you're all being nice to each other. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know that you can't one trust day, that guy or, basically because yeah. of your own efforts, mostly things are going to drastically change for these other people. And suddenly greed is going to rear its ugly head. And, you know, that suddenly every man is for himself, except they're all, they, as I had somebody put it to me once, well, they killed the goose that laid the golden egg, meaning me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 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 So that went on for, for years. Right. And, in. So all throughout the Yeah, I didn't but I didn't get the songs back and I didn't get the money back that was stolen. So um really I th I forget the word you if you call it resolution or something else. Closure maybe I, I don't remember. Well, what it is a person I'm a lot older guy, right? You live long enough in this world hopefully you get I mean look at it look at a year look at the times I've lived through. Yeah. I mean, just in the in the world stage, the world of events, and then my own personal uh, play. Yeah. Um, it's been rather uh, volatile and remarkable. And what I was getting at is, you get to be older. Hopefully, you have some perspective, and you really come to the con come to the realization of what actually matters. What's important? And I was lucky enough, by no uh, design of my own, by certainly no deserving, you know, any more than the next guy uh, of my own, I met a beautiful, wonderful woman who loved me for me. Yeah. Just cared about me. Yeah. Um, Lord knows she didn't know all the demons that were in the next room behind me. You know, she was <laughs> soon to learn about. Oh, sure I didn't know this came along with the program. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. Uh, meet this my, is a lot of work, yeah. John. These are my evil friends. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, anyway, and, you know, I, I fell in love. We fell in love. It's the most, you know, I can remember way back. When it first happened to me, I was I, I was babbling like an idiot. I would talk about it so much because it was like a new toy in my life. It was wow, love is everything. I mean, it would I would just I would grab people I'd known you know for years. And, Do you know what love is? Yeah. And I, come on, man, I just it's, got, you know yeah, yeah. this is how what it means. You yeah. know, I'd talk and talk and I'd talk and I'd wear people out. Well, it it is the truth. The the only thing in this world really is love. And to have a person, to have one yeah. person in your life that suddenly you realize they're more important than you are. Me, and I mean that in the sense that for me, she is more important than I am to yeah. me. Yeah. I would do anything for her. So therefore, all that selfish stuff. You know, again, this is a process, Mark. This didn't happen to me. Like I opened my eyes, she fluttered her eyes and i went boom you know like yeah. thumper in that sure. movie it it was a it took a while for yeah. me to get all this you know so with the, uh, with her love and with her support you were able to 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 get out of yourself and 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 get a little peace of mind the peace of mind is knowing and especially as as a family came along you realize that no amount of money in the world compares to 
having Julie and my kids in my life. No amount of money. No 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 fortune, no goal record or achievement or what it, it doesn't even come close. My frankly, my proudest achievement in my life is my family. It's it's you know, I get the ask Well what did you do? Was it Woodstock? What's the coolest thing? And they're always thinking in terms of career stuff. I go, No. My proudest achievement is meeting Julie and somehow not messing that up and then having my wonderful family with Julie because, you know, and this is sincere. This is the truth. <clears throat> some some of the days, especially when I was still kind of working it out and, you know, had all those anger emotions you talked about, I would I could open my eyes real wide and go, you know, my little boy here is so much more meaningful to me than that stupid contract and whatever money got lost or whatever. And, you know, it's holding my little child here, holding my wife, thinking about what we have is so much more fulfilling. I mean, it, it's obviously more precious. Were you able Therefore, to? Therefore, and, and, the, and the other side of that became very true to me, very clear to me. I mean, no amount of money can buy that. You can be that guy over there on Wall Street that owns, you know, half the East Coast, right? And all he really wants in his life is what I have. In fact, I've said that. he wants what I've got. That's exactly. And I've already got what I want, and that's that. It's as simple as that. Was, was, has this, like, in, in your new state of mind, has this been able – have you, have you been able to – because I know there was a lot of tension with the band – and there was a thing, and there was tension with your brother. Were you able to get any closure around that, or, or or make an amends along those lines with the guys in Credence, or or in in memory of your brother? The closure in my mind about my brother Tom, you know, in in the real world, while Tom was still alive, um, I had I don't know how long a story you want me to tell. I had I had actually tried to get real. You know, I mean, it was it was hurtful to me that we didn't get along, um, that there was obviously this gaping distance between us. And that went back to the band. Yeah, it it, it certainly was. I I couldn't quite. Julia has helped me a lot over the years. I couldn't quite define it in those days. I didn't quite know that a lot of it was jealousy. Right. But I didn't know that then because I didn't have that. I wasn't jealous of Tom. Right. I didn't have any jealousy in me. Right. I, so I wasn't experiencing that emotion. Does that make any sense? Yeah, to you? sure. I, I wasn't jealous. He I was, was happy just, doing what I had to do. But he was pissed off. And jealous. Yeah. Right? Uh, it, some of that must have been exacerbated because he was older. Therefore, he was first. He kind of was out in the limelight you know, in high school and all that while while I was still younger. So he experienced it earlier in his life and had had that longer and now uh, kind of had to take a back seat to me. I, you know, I'm just During the I'm kind of years. trying yeah. to reason this out. Anyway, I had heard the story when I was a kid about the Dorsey brothers, yeah. that Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey, you know, had a band together when they were kids and then they split up and didn't talk to each other for 30 years or something, right? They're, these are people from the old days yeah. when I was growing up. Yeah. My mom's music. Yeah. But then I heard that for their mother, for their mom, because their mom wanted them to, you know, get back together, they did. And, you know, near the end of their lives, they actually had a, that's the show that I saw Elvis Presley on, as a right. matter of fact, yeah, yeah, on yeah. TV. Um, so they were, you know, now uh, ju- rectified, whatever that word is, back together again. Yeah. And so I thought, man, you know, because my mom was ill, and I thought, you know, it, it would be really cool to do that for our mom. So I I was trying to engineer this to happen, yeah. you know, and I called Tom and wrote him a letter, and he kind of agreed. You know, he said, oh, yeah, cool. I said, well, look, I think, I think it's, this is just me, this is John talking, because I, you know, I had some anger, and I knew Tom did too. So I said, I think the quickest way to get there is if we just write down our issues, you know, why am I mad at you? Why are you mad at me? You know, whatever. If your list has a thousand lines on it, I don't care. Then we'll go over the list, right? Yeah. Now, Tom had always been sort of in a, he he managed to be a, a bit in, uh, I don't know, I want to call it either denial or some some sort of displacement sometimes from what was going on right now. 
I want to say displacement from reality, but that's a little hard. So he was hung up in the past when the band broke up and everything else. Yeah, he's hung up in those feelings because yeah, yeah. he was still doing that, right? Right. So anyway, so I, you know, he agreed. Yeah, we'll write down, you know. So I wrote down on my list, which later had probably six or seven lines. But the first thing I wrote was, Tom, I'm mad at you because you sued me. <laughs> so I sent that to him. Uh, and uh, he, we did it by phone. I know we talked by phone a few times, but he also, we could, we did letters. And he his response back was, no, I didn't. And so I'm going, Huh? Yeah. You know, what? Because <laughs> yeah. he sued you over so, the name. Well, yeah, he over sued me over. Uh, it's, it's very complicated. But at the time when all the money had disappeared from Credence and all that, um, from Saul Van Zant took it. Yes, yeah. the, this offshore, right? Um, whatever offshore banking tax deferral right. thing. You know, it's just it's very clumsy to or cumbersome to try and yeah okay explain but anyway um and so tom kept saying well no i didn't sue you so finally i you know found the a copy of the lawsuit first the the cover page you know that explains everything and there's you know tom fogarty and i think his wife uh his name too uh hereby sue or whatever join john fogarty da 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 you know here's a copy of the thing and i sent it to him it's just to, you know well tom yeah. you did sue me yeah don't say you didn't sue right. me i mean we're not getting anywhere if you just <laughs> deny what i've said i'm mad because you sued me yeah right so then his answer a little later was well you know uh, what happened was the <laughs> In his mind, what had happened was the morning of the trial in 1983, Tom walked up to my attorney and he said, I don't want to sue John anymore. So in his mind, he wasn't suing me. Yeah. And so that's why he answered, I didn't sue you. Right, right, right. You're right. The, the <laughs> Even paperwork though was I'd had to give, I don't know how many depositions and file papers and all of that over those six yeah, years yeah. or whatever it was, uh, you know, explain, uh, defending myself against that. Whew, yeah. Anyway, so we got past that one, and we went on whatever the whatever the second line was. We tried. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it was still sort of. I mean, this was really a hard work yeah, for yeah. you know everybody, I guess. Um, then Tom got ill. Yeah. Right, and he was dying, and a couple of times during that uh, long ongoing process, Tom revealed to me, "Well, you know, Saul's aunt is my best friend." Ugh. And so, <laughs> yeah. uh, so whenever he'd say something like that, I mean, he's ill, right? Yeah, right. So I can't really contest it. Right. Or try to argue. Well, no, he's not. Yeah. You know, because if, if the other guy says somebody's your best friend, you can't. How can you argue against it? That's what he believes. Yeah. Although, in my mind, I know that Saul's answer, you know what, Tom? He's using you, Tom. Sure. He's using you because now you won't go against him. You'll have you as an ally right. against me. So it, it kind of ended that way. Yeah, I mean, it just got complicated. That's pretty complicated, yeah, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, Tom was being used, and Saul was a, a really evil person to do that. But to s jump ahead in time to my wonderful yeah. life now, yeah. you know, I've thought of, obviously, I think of my brother, yeah. the guy that we sat in a room dreaming about music and hearing satisfaction in the car for the first time by the Rolling Stones and looking at each other that certain way yeah, when you yeah. when you hear something and go, oh, my God, listen to that, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. And I decided that, you know, if Tom was here, we would talk about it. I forgive you, Tom. Yeah. And I know he would because because I'm healed enough that I can forgive him. Yeah. It, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, you get that? Can you understand that? Sure. It's whatever it was that I, when I was angry, yeah. well, I'm not angry anymore. It, yeah. Those things don't matter anyway. Yeah, yeah. The, what, whatever money, whatever crap about Saul's ants, you know, wherever, and <laughs> I don't care. And they're, they're, because uh, that's not, what's right. important to me is my life here with Julie and my family. So you got, you got peace in your heart around this stuff. Right. That's so, good. so it's, it's important to me, at least in my on my side of the ledger, to have said to myself, you know, Tom, I forgive you. Meaning, whenever we do meet, you know, it's we're we're in a state of grace as far as I'm concerned. That's beautiful. 
and the and the and the and you got inducted into the Hall of Fame, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and that must have been a big night, huh? Yeah, That's it lasted about twenty four hours. Yeah, <laughs> it was a, it was a great night. It was you know I was happy. We our band us our music was being honored. As I said, I, I don't remember the whole speech, but I do know at some point I said uh, something to the effect of. I know we've had our ups and downs or something like that. And I said, but after all, at some point or at, at some point in time, we made some pretty great music together. Yeah. And that's, after all, why we're here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then the mush hit the fan. <laughs> yeah. With the other guys? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, is that is that resolved? No. You know, <laughs> it's... You know, now. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's hilarious to me, really, yeah. truly... I don't know. I, some guy, a lot, a lot of playwrights, a lot wiser than me, yeah. have sort of been devil's advocate. You know, almost like the little devil himself up on the tree branch, sure. looking down at humanity and just shaking their head at how easy it is to keep the 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 little Humans. barnyard animals yeah, yeah, yeah. upset in every way. Yeah, as Alan Wolf said. A little red rooster. Um, yeah. I mean, quite innocently, just a couple of years ago, somebody was asking me, well. Do you think there'll ever be a reunion? Because they always ask that question, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the first thing that happened was, because I'm, I'm asked all the time, but this particular time, I said, wow, you know you know what just happened? He goes, what? I said, well, in the days gone by, I would always, like, you, it's like you push the button, and I go, no, you'll never have a reunion. You know? yeah. But this time, it's like, I was just like, real easy going about it. I said, you know, I don't know. Maybe it could happen. My my knee didn't jerk. In other words, I didn't have an automatic response because I because I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, you know, and I'm I'm kind of looking out from my porch. Yeah, you know, I got my little lemonade sitting here, and I'm yeah. going, oh, this big old world. You never know what's gonna. You know, I'm looking at the freeway across the yeah. the lot over there, and cars going this way, yeah, and yeah. trucks going that way, and I don't know. You never know what might happen. So the guy prints that right. He said, John seems kind of mellow about. <laughs> The idea that <laughs> yeah. there might be a reunion, you yeah. know, because I'm at I'm at peace. Yeah, not a week went by, maybe three days. Yeah. the other guys are in a, in somebody's article. No, 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 it's too late. We're never going to have it. Yeah, you know, and I had, I read that, and I you know I just kind of said to the yeah. wind, yeah. yeah, I guess they're still mad. <laughs> <laughs> you know? okay, just a couple more questions. The the performance at Woodstock. Uh, is there any tape of that, man? Is there tape of that? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah? Yeah, I think the, probably the whole thing was more or less recorded. But you didn't sure. want it in? Now, you you have to... Re- well, eventually it, it has been used. Yeah. Um, you have to remember way back at the time, um, we had played Woodstock. We <laughs> we followed the Grateful Dead. <laughs> the, the, talk about that hippie <laughs> lifestyle you were talking about a while ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, this would be probably the Technicolor poster boy yeah. example of yeah. uh, all of it gone wrong. The, the dead got on, you know, the whole thing was r- running late anyway. Yeah. yeah. And we were supposed to be on at something like 10 o'clock. We were promised, a, you know, a really uh, Prime spot. prominent yeah. position yeah. on Saturday night. Well, it got to be past midnight, then it got to be one. Um, you know, and then the dead ambles on stage and they play a few songs. Then their equipment breaks, you know, and it's like, oh, hey, Jerry, <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Oh, where's my guitar? I don't know, man. <laughs> you know, the equipment broke. And so there was no music at Woodstock for 45 minutes or whatever. Uh, right. Yeah. Then finally they, they insist or persist on coming back out. They finally find the electric, you know, the 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 electrical outlet, and they plug in an amp or whatever, and they start playing. By the way, it was "Turn On Your Love Light." Uh, yeah, Bobby Bland song. Well, yeah, I love that version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this was some white boys yeah, yeah. from uh, Milpitas. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, and so they play for like another forty-five minutes after that. I mean, it's getting late. Yeah. So Creedence comes out finally on stage. I don't even know. Here they are, Creedence, Clearwater. You know, they yeah, run yeah. out. We play our first song. It's probably Born on the Bayou. Yeah, and we're yeah. trying to kick out the jams. And finally, I look down at the people. Well, they're all asleep. They're all muddy, naked, and asleep. And so I'm, you know, I'm stomping up and down. At some point, I literally 
walk up to the mic, you know, it's just, I mean, this was, you know, this was a, it was to be a big opportunity for my little band from El Cerrito, right? And I look out and I said, man, you know, we're up here, we're just rocking, we're, 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 we're hoping to do a good job for you, we're having a good time, we hope you are too, and I'm yeah. looking out, you know, nothing, I mean, yeah. no response, finally, some guy way out in the darkness is, you know, flicking his big, yeah. and he goes, don't worry about it, John. We're with you. I mean, the fact that in a half a million people, I could hear that one guy a quarter mile away is astonishing. Yeah. Because everybody else, the only thing you could hear was snoring. Yeah. Well, the Grateful Dead had put a half a million people to sleep, right? Yeah. So I just, you know, Credence at this point in, in the middle of 1969, we were on our third gold single. Probably had three albums in the top t- in the top ten. You know, it was pretty clear that we had a hold of the that freight train. They're rolling down the track at a yeah. pretty high speed. That was all really, really great. And I just and it wasn't right then, by the way. It was a year later, maybe somebody sent me a tape of Bad Moon Rising, and it, we were thinking of putting this in this movie we're making, right? Yeah, the Woodstock and movie. I, I listened to it, and it is. You know, it's kind of a sideways version. It was yeah. okay. Yeah. It wasn't horrible, but there was no, like, extra oomph. No electricity. And, right. And Well, I mean, and I just thought everything else we're doing is like, you know, be, what do they call it nowadays terms? Over the moon, you yeah, know? Yeah, Hitting it out of the park. Yeah. And here's this thing that's kind of, you know, not so, it doesn't show us yeah, in, yeah, in yeah, a yeah. great light. Right. And I just thought, wh- why do I want to be part of something like that? Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. So I just said no. Um you know, years, years and years and years went by, and finally uh, I did say yeah because it was, you know, by now it was just historic. Yeah. But it wasn't helping the career at all. It I was, get it. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was kind of, uh, it was showing a weakness, you might say. Sure. You know? um, Carlos Santana, of course, in the daylight because you couldn't take film in those days at night. It right. It was basically 10 feet away and yeah. you were a shadow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Carlos looked was really killer. It looked yeah. great. And of course Jimmy, Jimmy, all dressed in white in the morning light. But it's sort of hilarious. Jimmy had in his contract he had to close the show. He had to be the final act of Woodstock. So by God, the, that next morning, whatever morning, I think it was Monday morning yeah. after the whole thing, like seven o'clock in the morning after everyone has left, <laughs> Jimmy's out there doing purple haze. You know, to a couple of cows and a lot of trash. <laughs> and that was the mythic performance. Yeah. That was amazing. But he looked great. God, yeah. He looked great. Yeah. Well, I, I want to say this is that this album, the, the new one, uh, wrote a song for everyone, is, is just great. And I listened to it twice. And, you know, all these versions of your songs and the new songs are great. Thank you. And I, and I got to tell you, personally, you know, when I was younger and you know, I listened to you guys in high school and I had the you know, greatest hits album and all these other records that I got from my uncle, the ones I still have, the Credence records, you know, and then when you, you guys sort of disappeared, when I remember when Center Field came out, you know, I had this, I went out and bought it and I was so excited that you sounded so damn good and oh, those songs you. were so great. And, you know, and I kind of put that in the shelf of my head. And then, you know, I interviewed Dave Grohl, you know, uh-huh, when he was yeah. working on Sound City. And I was at Sundance with IFC for a different thing. And I went. Oh, did you uh, come see us? Well, I went and saw you. And, you know, when you got out, how do you, you know, when you got out there, it was like everything else just paled. Like, you know, you got out there and I heard you sing in, in, the, in the exact same tenor that you always had. And I, I cried. I was so <laughs> thrilled <laughs> to you. see you up there and just to see, you know, you doing your songs, you know, with the same amount of heart you always had. And, and, and it's just been a great uh, honor to talk to you. Oh, well, thank you, Mark. You know, you what you've done is you've sort of re reinforced, you know, what passion is. You, you Basically, it, yeah, it's really important to me. And I dare say... Certainly, at a at a certain time in all our lives, and if we're lucky enough, we get to yep. keep that passion. Yeah. That when it's so important to you, and you want to, you want to really do the best you can. You want you're trying to be great, as it were. And your audience, obviously, you felt that way from a connection from when when you were young. You know, you you carry that because it it really matters to you, yeah. right? I yeah. mean, it really matters to me. There's 
I mean, you know, when you're when you're teenage and you have the the guys in music, especially, or it might be sports, or it might be, you know, a movie star or something. But it's really, really important to you. It may be the most important thing to you, uh, and you keep that passion. If you're lucky, you get to hang on to that, you know, throughout your life and have that that same sense of the well, man, this is really important. I care about this. Yeah, yeah. And you still got it, man. I appreciate that. Thanks, Thanks for talking to me. You bet. I was ecstatic driving away from that interview. I hope you enjoyed it. I listened to the record on the way back. I'm telling you, man, the version of I, As Long As I Can See the Light with My Morning Jacket, it's making me cry thinking about it. I swear to God. It was a real honor for me to meet him and talk to him. Just a very special day for me. I hope you enjoyed that. Let me tell you what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be in Phoenix at Stand Up Live on Thursday, June 6th. I'm going to be doing a book event at Politics and Pros at 6 and I in Washington, D.C., Tuesday, June 11th. I will be doing a book event at Barnes & Noble in Union Square in New York City, June 12th. I will be doing a book event at the Bryant Park Summer Reading Series, hosted by Ju- Julie Klausner, I believe, June 13th. That's a Thursday. And I'll be at the Brattle Theater for the Harvard Bookstore on June 14th. That's Friday. My old stomping grounds. Uh, there's also a, an event uh, with me and some of my writers and uh, Bobcat Goldthwaite and a couple of the writers uh, going to be doing an event at the Paley Center here in Los Angeles on Tuesday, June 18th. And I'm sure other things will pop up between then and now. Don't forget, I'll be at the Ice House in Pasadena June 2nd, Los Angeles people, with Dave Anthony doing something. Get yourself some Just Coffee. I've actually got some right now. They should send me some. I'm almost out. Hold on. Haven't done one of these in a while. Pow! I just shit my pants. Look out. JustCoffee.com.coop. Wow. It has been a while. Forgot the uh, the tag there. JustCoffee.coop. What else? I told you about Mike Lawrence's album. Mike Lawrence is a very funny kid. Go get it. Sadamantium. <laughs> yeah. And again, the music today was by the Zigzags. Mike's album comes out on the 20th. iTunes and Amazon. Zigzags did the music today. I'm fucking, I, gotta, I have to go write my intro for, uh, for John Fogarty for tomorrow night. Which I think I, what I should go with is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this man has made some of the, ladies and gentlemen, this guy, ladies and gentlemen, this rocker, ugh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring, are you ready for a great show? Are you ready for a great show? I want to, intro, this guy needs no introduction. See, now it seems trite. This guy... Ladies and gentlemen, the man I'm about to bring to the stage has written some of the most amazing and perfect rock songs in the history of rock and roll, and they are timeless. How often can you say that about an artist? That's that his songs are timeless. Please welcome to the stage one of the greatest rock and roll artists to ever live, Mr. John Fogarty, ladies and gentlemen. John Fogarty. It's close, right? Boomer lives. <laughs> 